Hey there, whether you're a part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It is our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from these resources, we ask that they are only supplemental and no way replace a commitment to a gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, just simply email info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Well, good morning. How are you? It's good to be with you here today. If this is your first time joining us online or in the room, welcome. We're glad that you've joined us today. And if you're a part of our Synagogue family, I love it. Stand on up. We're going to worship today. Worship Jesus. Today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate the God who came for us, the God with love in His eyes. And that's who we worship, is King Jesus. So let's sing. Let's declare His word. Your home. 
Savior. Our identity is found in Him and Him alone.
on that name and so we can sing turn your eyes upon prayer today. Together we declare can we say that we need you, we love you, and to see you is to see life rightly, it's to see true reality. And so today we just want to see you. We know and believe that your name is beautiful, that you and what you've done is so wonderful, and your name is powerful. It is mighty to save, it is mighty to break the strongholds of our sin and life but it's also such a sweet name to behold and to see. So help us to see you more clearly. Help us to see you rightly today. As your word is open, may it just peer into the depths of our hearts and our sinful hearts. Convict us, call us deeper, call us back to yourself. Help us to see you rightly and see you fully. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to see you on this Palm Sunday morning. You know, there are times uh, that the Lord has appointed for his people just to pause. Times for uh, his people to pause so that uh, he can uh, recall them to himself and uh, refocus them on what he has done and on who he is. And this is always for us one of those times. It's always for us one of those times on Palm Sunday to pause. And that is why we share together Palm Sunday by Palm Sunday in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time to pause. It's a time to pause and reflect on Christ on what he's done for us and what that means. It's, it's a time for us to pause and reflect on the condition of our own souls. It's a time for us to pause and uh, confess our sins, a time for us to pause and receive from him fresh grace, fresh forgiveness, fresh hope, fresh rest in him. And so today we're taking time to pause as uh, he calls us to and as we, as we uh, tend to do here at Center Grove on Palm Sunday. And, you know, it strikes me that one of the, the realities of our present lives is that we need the opportunity to pause now more than perhaps many of us ever have uh, before. We live in a time of great confusion. Nothing seems to be as it was. Uh, uh, much has happened in the last 36 months and everywhere we look, there is massive change and massive uncertainty. And in times like this, the need for uh, more deliberate personal pauses in the frenetic flow of, of life around us is, is even greater. We need pauses in order to do something that well, few of us are naturally inclined to do, and that is to, to stop 
and consider the state of our souls. To stop and ask, how is my soul doing? What's the condition of my life before God? It's easy in in times like these for for our souls to become unsettled and unsure and, and, and for us not even to know it. We just know that we are overwhelmed. We, we just know that we're, we're taking in more than we can, can actually handle. We're overwhelmed by a flood of challenges emotionally and physically and spiritually. And, and even for believers, there, there are constant opportunities for, for fear and anxiety and anger and despair and depression. And, and so today, I, I want us to pause in the supper. But I want us to pause before we pause in the supper by taking some time in the word of God to hear from the Lord of the supper, to hear from him how it is we should be living, we can be living in an age that is so overwhelming. So I want to invite you to do do this, join me in one of the shortest psalms in in all the scripture, Psalm 131, Psalm 131. We want to see how the Lord calls us to live when we live in an age of overwhelm. Psalm 131, O Lord, the psalmist says, my heart is not lifted up, My eyes are not raised too high. I don't occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But instead, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. That's it, three verses. Now I wanna say to you this morning that what you have before you in this Psalm is one of the most comforting Psalms in all of the Psalter, which is the the word for, for all the Psalms taken together, Psalter. But it is one of the most comforting Psalms in all of the Psalter. I like the summary of it that uh, the Old Testament, the great Old Testament scholar, uh, John Golden Gay gave it in his his, uh, massive commentary. He he says that the the summary or the theme of this little, little psalm is this, how I gave up trying to fix things and why you should too. How I gave up trying to fix things and why you should too. (laughs) I like that. Now it helps to understand that this psalm is found in a larger section of psalms that serve as good medicine for the soul, especially for the soul that is overloaded and overcome by life. They're, They're called, all of these psalms together are called psalms of ascent, meaning that they are journey psalms meant to be sung as worshipers made their way up to the temple at festival times. They are psalms, in other words, for people who, regardless of where they are or how they're doing, know where they're going, but just haven't gotten there yet. They know there are people who are on their way up. They know that they are a people on their way to him who is their home, And it's noteworthy that this group of of psalms, from Psalm 120 to to Psalm uh, 134, this group of psalms falls into five groups. The first four groups, each covers a different condition that all human beings find overwhelming. From Psalm 120 to 122, we find the psalms describing a life overwhelmed by trouble or danger. In 123 to 125, we find a life described as overwhelmed by the loss of resources needed for life. Can anyone say inflation? 
Can anyone say, I looked at the pump the other day and said, wait a minute, I wasn't here to make a car payment, I was here to buy a tank of gas. Can anybody, can anybody say that? It's not good when you have to look at the pump three times. It's just not good. In Psalms 126 to 128, we find a life uh, uh, described that is overwhelmed by failure in, in work and relationships. And, and in 129 to 131, where we are today, we, we find a life described as overwhelmed by sin and its consequences. And this group of Psalms from 132 to 134 concludes by describing life and what it's like when the overwhelming has been overwhelmed by God and God's people find their way home. And that means that Psalm 133 for us is a pivotal psalm. It's an important psalm, short as it is, because it's right there on the cusp between all of these descriptions of, 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 of failure and loss and disappointment and tragedy and all those things that can overwhelm us. It's right in that pivot point between, between those sections and the final section where God's people make it home and all that overwhelms them is overwhelmed. The psalmist uh, gives us an extraordinary gift in these three verses because he himself is being overwhelmed. The partner psalm to 131 is 130 and uh, 130 sets 131 up. But he gives us a word of advice and he gives us a word of comfort for the times that we're overwhelmed. He, he shares a word of testimony and challenge and he tells us, what he found that gives him the two things that every person who is overwhelmed always wants. And what is that? Rest and hope. Rest and hope. When we're feeling overwhelmed, we want rest. We want to rest and we need hope. He said, this is how I found them. But he, but he does more than just tell us what he's found. He shares with us the secret to finding what he found for ourselves in spite of whatever overwhelming thing we face. Hey, and I'm, I'm just going to pause and tell you. You know, as a pastor, I, I get to talk with many of you and walk with many of you through, through life situations and dynamics. And our other pastors do as well. And one of the things that we notice, of course, is that uh, feeling overwhelmed is, is part of what we sense happening in the body of Christ here. And, and it's not a criticism, it's a reality. It's the way everybody feels right now. So I wanna to say to you, this is really, really important. So take a deep breath. There you go, did you hear that? Good. And let's see what the Lord has to say to us. Now, in Psalms 130 to 131, the psalmist shows us how when he was overwhelmed, he sought God's help and then he had to wait. Now, that's not the news that we want to hear, is it? I was overwhelmed. I sought the Lord's help, and I had to wait. But that's what he says. Look at Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6. He says, he confesses, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the, for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. He says it twice. He says, I'm overwhelmed and I cry out to the Lord and I'm waiting. But in Psalm 131, he shows us not only what this waiting on the Lord looks like, what this waiting while overwhelmed looks like, but he actually shows us why it's a good thing to have to wait when you're overwhelmed. He shows us why it's the best thing any overloaded, overrun, and overwhelmed believer can do. It's the best thing you can wait. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't want to wait. I want, I want some relief. No, 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 no. You want to wait. He said, no, I don't want to wait. I, I want some. I know, I know, just, but let's hear what the scripture says and see, see what you decide afterward, all right? I want you to see with me, this almost reveals to us three things. He shows us what he unlearned when he was overwhelmed. He shows us what he learned when he was overwhelmed. And then he shows us what he found as a result of what he learned. He shows us what he unlearned. He shows us what he learned. 
and he shows us the result of, of what he learned. Let's take a look at each of those. See with me what he unlearned first when he was overwhelmed. We find it all in verse one. He says, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high and I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. Now, what you may not know or may not see immediately is that in the ancient language, this picture is, is pretty fascinating. It, the, the, in the ancient language, he is actually describing some conditions that were true of him at one point in the past that are no longer true of him now. And so what we have in verse one is almost a word of thanksgiving. He says, oh Lord, you know, this, this was me, this is not me. This was me, this is not me. Three times, this was me, this is not me. And you know, and I'm so thankful for what I have unlearned during my time of being overwhelmed. There are three stances, if you will, three approaches to life that the psalmist used to use and used to take when he was faced with hardships. Stances that he used to take, in fact, stances all human beings tend to take naturally when they're faced with something that seems to want to overwhelm them. What did he unlearn? He unlearned three things. That living should be done with a heart lifted up. He unlearned the lesson that living should be done with eyes raised high. And he unlearned the idea that living should be done with self occupied with doing great and marvelous things. Let me unpack those for you. What did he unlearn while he was being overwhelmed? First, the first lesson he unlearned is, is the importance of living with a heart lifted up. Our world tells us if you're going to make it, you, you got to live with a heart lifted up. Now, uh, this approach teaches us to say, I believe in me. I believe in me. Now, a heart lifted up is, is actually a mind that thinks highly of itself. It's another way of describing pride. It's a, it is a heart lifted up that puts itself in the place of God or, or sees itself like God in a way in importance. It's almost like I'm a little God, God's a big God, but I'm a little God and, and so I believe in me. Wise people, of course, flee seeing themselves as that impressive or that all important because they know in the end that kind of perspective uh, has a, a, a very, very uh, destructive ending. Seeing yourself as somehow like God, and there's not a person in this room who's going to say, I'm God. I, I know that, but we can tend to see ourselves as so important that we're almost equal with God Seeing yourself as like God always ends in bitter disappointment because we can't live up to our own view of ourselves. If you think too much of yourself, you will let yourself down. Have, have you seen that? If you think too much of yourself, you will let yourself down. And it isn't just disappointment that comes, but real danger and, and real downfall. Uh, Haughtiness comes before destruction, pride before a fall. So you can have a high opinion of yourself and, and it may even be justified, but the problem is what it leads to. Trouble every time. This, he said, I've unlearned that. I've unlearned that. I can't believe in me because there's not a lot for me to believe in. Second lesson he unlearned is living with high eyes is the secret to uh, overcoming when you're overwhelmed. This is the approach in life that teaches us to say, I matter and I matter most. Eyes raised too high are the eyes of the heart aiming high for things for self while looking down on others. It's another way of describing vain ambition, the desire to elevate self and put one's own interests before others. In the Proverbs, uh, these eyes are called high eyes, high eyes. 
And it's the first thing that the Lord says he hates and opposes in people when he finds it in them. So whereas a heart that is lifted up actually is lifted up against God by seeking to take or share his place, eyes that are raised too high are raised against other people. They look down on other people and look for advantages uh, against other people. And so the lifted heart says, I'm like God. The high eyes say, I'm better than you and I deserve the best. The first is pride, the second is ambition. And it leads, this combination leads to a life that treats the self as the only one who counts and causes us, watch this, when overwhelming things come, causes us to grab for control and to grab for protection when the overwhelming comes because we've got to protect this God that we are and this all important person that we are. A final lesson the psalmist unlearned is a self-occupation with doing great and marvelous things. This life approach teaches us to say, I can do anything I choose to do, overcome anything that tries to overcome me. I can do anything I choose to do. And we, we say this to our kids, and it's su- such, a, such a, 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 false, a falsehood. You can be anything you want to be. They can't. I can do anything I choose to do. I can overcome anything that, that tries to overcome me. The psalmist describes this way of living as, do you see it, a self, a self that is occupied with too much, a, a life occupied or driven or focused on things too great or too marvelous for it. These great and marvelous things are more often than not in the Bible, those things that only God as God can do. So the picture here is of a life that is being lived as if all that is overwhelming us can be overwhelmed by us. When we were walking through COVID, what did, what did we keep hearing publicly? We're gonna beat this, we're gonna beat this, we're gonna beat this, we're gonna beat this, we can do 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 this. And we did do something, but we didn't do all that we said we were going to do in the time that we said we were going to do it. In the way we said we were going to do it, we didn't do it. Because why? We can't do it. We can do some things, but we can't do God things. So this is a picture of life that's lived as if all that is overwhelming us can be overwhelmed by us. It says, I can and I should do great things. I I have all I need to fix whatever is threatening to fix me. But the psalmist says no more. I've learned better what I can do and what I can't. He says, I've learned there are many times I can't fix my world. So the implication here is that being overwhelmed by trouble and losses and failures and sins has actually been used of God in the psalmist's life to teach him who he is and who he isn't and what he can and what he can't do. Wise people, the implication is, let God teach them from the experience of being overwhelmed by situations and circumstances, the reality of life, the reality of who they are and who they're not, and they thank him for it. Because reality is always your friend, never your enemy. Fantasy is your enemy, not reality. God wants us to live in reality. And so he thanks him for it. Why? Well, because the reality is this. There are and there always will be things that come into our lives that we can do absolutely nothing about. And wise people know the difference between the things they can do something about and the things they can't. There are things that we cannot control, no matter how high our hearts are lifted, no matter how high our eyes may look, no matter how occupied we may be with fixing what we're facing. And so the psalmist says, I have learned to say no to these things. In other words, he has learned to let go of the things he can't control by letting go of the idea that he can control. Then he moves on and he goes on to show us what he learned when he was overwhelmed. Look at verse two. But he says, but I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. 
Now, verse two also comes as a word of thanksgiving for a lesson learned while being overwhelmed by life. Now that he's freed of living with an inflated view of himself before God and others and an inflated view of his abilities, the psalmist says he's made the choice to replace this old way of living with another way. Instead of lifting up his heart, instead of raising his eyes, instead of occupying himself with controlling everything and everyone around him, instead of telling himself over and over again, I believe in me, I can do anything I want to do, and all those other mantras that our culture gives us, instead of doing that, he says, I've learned to do something else. He says, I've learned to calm and quiet my spirit when the overwhelming things come. How? Now, this is going to be uncomfortable, especially for you men. How many men do we have here today? Yeah, see, that's a challenge most men can't resist. All right, men, hang on with me, will you? Just trust me and hang, hang with me. How does, he, how does he calm and quiet his soul? By seeing himself, he says, like a child and turning toward the Lord like a child turns to a mother. He says in a simile, I have made my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Now, I'll grant you this sounds a bit odd. It's not super attractive to men. But it is powerful when you understand it. The mother-child, of course, uh, mother-child relationship is, of course, a very close one physically. And when that relationship is healthy, it continues to be close after birth so that the child comes to know its mother as a person and as a place of security and provision and therefore rest. Even after the child is weaned, rest. Provision, security, that's the way the child sees the mother. No doubt the psalmist remembers his own childhood or he's watched what goes on between a mother and and a young child who Though weaned from the mother knows from the past she is a sure place. When you're in trouble, go to mama. All the mothers are saying, that's right. The uh, open, open, open sign is on the front door. You come home. This is the stance the psalmist has learned to take in all of life's challenges. He Watch this, he releases whatever he can't control. He runs to the one who can control it and he rests there like a toddler with his mother. And this, my friends, is what waiting for God in the overwhelming storms of life actually looks like. Sitting in the Father's lap and resting, not because the overwhelming thing is gone, but because the Father is present and he's close in it. He's able to keep you in spite of it, able to resolve it when he knows it is best. He runs, he releases, he runs, he rests. He releases what he cannot control. He runs to the one who can't control it and he rests there. Notice finally what he found as a result of what he learned while he was overwhelmed. Verse 3, he says, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now, what I haven't told you about this psalm, you might have already seen just under the, uh, the uh, marker, Psalm 131, a psalm of ascents by who? David. Now, this is fascinating. This is really fascinating. This psalm was written by Israel's greatest king. This psalm was written by one of the most gifted, capable men who has ever lived. Brilliant strategist, a writer of poems and music, and a great warrior. He was the man every woman wants to love and know, and the man that every man wants to be. That was David. He was a man who had known great success as a king. Of all people, if anybody had an opportunity to live with a lifted heart, with high eyes, with a life occupied with doing great and marvelous things, it it was David. And so it makes this all the more astounding that in verses 1 and 2, this David confesses 
something we don't ever expect to hear from powerful people. And his plea in verse 3 to his own nation of people who don't have his abilities and gifting and don't have his power makes his plea all the more weighty. The great David says, listen, I have a word for you. When life overruns you, when life overloads you, when life overwhelms you, don't put your hope in yourself. And whatever you do, don't put your hope in me. I may be your king, but I'm not the king you're looking for. I may be your king. I may be a king. I may be a powerful king, but I am not the king you're looking for because here's the reality. I can be overwhelmed too. Everybody right now is looking for a king, whether they know it or not. Everybody's looking for a king. I need a king to solve our climate crisis. I need a king to solve inflation. I need a king to solve Putin and and the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. I need a king to deal with COVID once and for all. I, I need a king to settle the global order. I need a king to make things right. I need a king to give me peace. I need a king to give me rest. Everybody is looking for a king. Everybody's looking. And here is the king of Israel saying, yes, I'm your king, but I'm not the king you're looking for because I can be overwhelmed just like you. So listen, when life overruns you, overloads you, and uh, overwhelms you, don't put your hope in yourself and don't put your, self, your hope in me. No, put your hope in the Lord and leave it there. That's what now and forever means. Leave it there. Put your hope in the Lord and leave it there. Drop it off, leave it there. He says, oh, Israel, do what I do. Learn what I've learned. Release what you can't control. Run to him who can control it and rest there. It's finding your rest in him that brings lasting hope in the face of anything you're facing. So what does this mean for you and me? Well, it basically means this. When you're overwhelmed, with trouble, loss, failure, and sin. And you can't fix your world. Find the one who can and stay there till he does. When you can't fix your world, find the one who can and stay there close until he does. It's in the waiting that you'll find rest. It's in the waiting you'll find hope. This is curious to me, but this is the one choice you and I can make every time we find ourselves when we're overwhelmed. This is the one choice we can make because the one person I can control is And I even struggle with that, do you? Huh? The one person I have the the greatest success controlling, how about I should say that, is me. I don't always do a good job there, but that's the only, only, only one. That is my choice. I can't fix you. I cannot fix the world. I cannot fix... The situations that might happen, could happen, would happen, should happen, shouldn't happen. I cannot fix any of that. I cannot control the world. I cannot control people. I cannot control circumstances or situations. I cannot control. The only thing I can control is me. And the choice I can make when I can't fix my world is to find the one who can Run to him and stay there till he does what I can't do. I can put myself squarely in the proven care, in the lap, if you will, of a proven father and leave myself there. I 
I can choose to wait on the Lord. Now here's the reality. Overwhelming circumstances, sometimes they come and sometimes they stay. And when they do, we're always tempted to try to fix it ourselves. To lift our hearts to places they shouldn't be, to raise our eyes to things they shouldn't see, to drive ourselves to attempt things we can't do in search of relief. But the great opportunity of God's people when they are overwhelmed is precisely this, to choose waiting and resting over acting. It is the first and best choice for us when overwhelmed by life and change and challenge. Release what's causing the overwhelm. Run to him and rest there. When you are overwhelmed with trouble, loss, failure, sin, and find you can't fix your world, pause. 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 Go back to the one who can and stay there close till he does what only he can do. So what in the world does this have to do with the Lord's Supper? Everything. Absolutely everything. Why? Because every supper shows us the cross, reminds us of the resurrection, points us to the Christ who came for us, points us to the Christ who is coming again for us. Every time we come to the supper, God says, pause, check on your soul, see how you're doing, and remember, you are to be living waiting. You are living between the time I first came and the time that I will come again. The supper reminds us every single time you cannot fix your world, but there is a king who can. There is a place you can run. It's called a cross and an empty tomb. Run there, stay close, and I promise you, God says, I will fix it. You can live waiting on him with hope. You can live in every circumstance of your life releasing what you can't control. You can run to him who has all control, the one who has defeated sin and death. You can rest close to him knowing that one day he's going to come. He's going to fix you. He's going to fix me. And he's going to fix all that's been overwhelming us. So when you are overwhelmed, loved ones hear me when you are overwhelmed and you can't take another news report and you're having to decide between putting more gas in your in your truck or putting food on the table when you're dealing with relational issues you can't overcome and your heart is breaking. When your successes have turned to failures. When your sin has overwhelmed you and the guilt will not let you go. When you find you cannot fix your world. Pause. Find the one who can. Stay close there till he does what you cannot do. Crawl on up into his lap. There is no better, safer place to be than that.
So the reality is Psalm 131 is a perfect passage for the Lord's Supper. For it points us to the king we need, the king we have, the king who is coming, the king who gives rest, and the king who is our hope. To all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Mm. Mm. Sometimes we just need a little refreshment, huh? Yeah, that's good. Well, let's move now, shall we, to the Lord's Supper. And uh, as you've come in, you've received uh, the elements. If you're new uh, here today and you've never seen this before, um, this, of course, is not normal. It's not old normal for us. It's new normal for us. Uh, But let me explain it to you quickly. Uh, You'll find clear cellophane wrapper right at the very top. I don't want you to open it just yet because you might lose it. But you see a clear cellophane right under, and underneath it you'll find a thicker piece of, uh, I guess, kind of aluminum foil that you'll pull. <laughs> so the bread is right at the top, the, uh, the cup, the juice is right at the bottom. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Um, you are invited to share in this supper if you're a follower of Jesus. You've given your life to Him. Uh, he belongs to you and you belong to Him. What is critical though, the scripture teaches us is that we know the condition of our souls before we partake of it. We know where we stand, what's going on in our own hearts and lives. And so the scripture calls on us, Paul does in 1 Corinthians to examine our lives, to examine ourselves before we share in this, to see first, do we have a living personal relationship with Christ? But secondly, Is my life free of the things that would offend him? Have I in some way been living, we're going to say this today, have I in some way been living with a heart lifted too high? Have I had pride in my life? Have I had eyes looking too high and down on others? What is the condition of my relationship with things and people? What is my relationship with God like? What is my relationship with things and people like? It, is my, are my relationships as they should be? Have I been living my life as if I have all of the answers? Have I lived, been living according to my own wisdom rather than His wisdom for life? All of these are questions that we need to lay before the Lord and, and ask Him by His Holy Spirit to speak to us about each of those areas. And having done that, and when he shows us, of course, anything that is amiss, and virtually we all will find something amiss. When we do find that, confessing it, acknowledging it, turning from it, asking for his forgiveness, then prepares us to remember his broken body and not take it for granted, to share in his his cup, representing his blood, and not take that for granted find fresh forgiveness, fresh hope, fresh encouragement in our walks with Christ. So, following the scripture, we're going to take some time today, right here, right now, alone in the presence of the Lord, and ask him our our classic question, what, Father, do you see when you see me? What is the state of my soul? What is the state of my soul, my relationship with you, my relationship with others, the life I'm living? Is it all yours or is it mine? Whatever you show me, I will confess. I will repent and make right. I want to be prepared to share in this celebration rightly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Each of us, all of us, right here and now.
Father God, you've given us your Holy Spirit. to convict us of sin, of the need for righteousness and of the consequences of sin, even in the believer. And for this, we're grateful. Spirit of God, forgive us for when we have quenched you with careless sin, with sin unconfessed. Forgive us for when we've lived below our calling. Forgive us, Father, for not making much of the cross of your great Son, our Savior. And forgive us, Lord Jesus, for so easily forgetting the price you paid so that we might live free of sin. We bless you, Lord God, for your great standing promise that you will take our sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west. And by the shed blood of Christ, our sins are removed and can be forgiven and our fellowship with you restored. Claiming these promises, Lord, we come now to the table and round the supper to share in the, in the reminder of our Lord Jesus' broken body and shed blood. Pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, the scripture says he, he was gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And toward the end of the evening, he gave them the gift of a memorial supper, a time to remember him, a time to pause, to check on the condition of their soul. And he began with the bread representing his broken body. And so we want to begin doing what he did. He blessed the bread and he distributed it and said, remember me as you take it. So I'm going to ask uh, Mark Reese to come and ask the blessing on the broken, uh, blessing and and, uh, word of thanksgiving for the broken body of Christ. And we will sharing that together, Mark. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we just uh, pause in this moment. And Father, as we reflect and prepare for the supper, Lord, we just want to say thank you for Jesus. Father, we recognize that as we take this bread and we break this bread, this reflects the, uh, the broken body of our Lord and Savior. So Father, today we just want to say that we love you thank you for Jesus and we thank you for the moment that you're giving us that we can reflect that we can remember and Lord help us to move forward as we leave this place to reflect you in everything that we do everything that we say and Father we just ask that you would just um, bless this time that we have now in Jesus name I pray Amen Take if you would the wafer there body of Christ broken for you. He was broken because you and I were. He was broken so that we would not stay that way. He was broken. And for that, we're grateful. Take, eat all of it. To all God's people said, Dave Wright will ask you to come and do the same for the cup representing the shed blood of Jesus. Good Father, we, uh, we're so grateful that the radiance of the glory of God, the creator of the world, he who holds everything together would lay aside his glory and become a man and take the sin of the world upon him, though he knew no sin of his own. And Father, now as we partake of this cup, we're reminded of of the sacrifice that he made for us. And we commit afresh to walk in a manner worthy of our Savior with your help and the guidance of your spirit. 
In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you lift that second cover. This cup, Jesus said, is the new covenant, the new, the new uh, agreement that comes now between a holy God and a sinful people through the, blood, the, the shed blood of Christ. The unholy are made holy and the sinner is welcomed home. And we bless God for the shed blood of Jesus for it is his shed blood that made our homecoming possible. Amen. Drink all of it. Amen. All God's people said, amen. Let's stand together. In uh, the very first supper, the uh, scripture says they sang a hymn and went out. And we too are going to sing a song of praise as we go from this place, remembering him to whom we can run and stay, the one who will not fail us, who keeps us even when we're overwhelmed and as we're overwhelmed, the one who fixes what we cannot fix and loves us enough to bring us finally home. Let's sing. Saturday and our two regular Sunday times. Grab a stack, invite someone to come hear the good news that Jesus is alive and we are alive with Him. We'll see you next week. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access a discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove what we're up to, and access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.